This is An Economy of One with Gary Ratman. Joining me now is Gordon Chang. He's a lawyer and author who's lived in China and Hong Kong for almost two decades. Most recently in Shanghai, working as counsel to the American law firm Paul Weiss. He's the author of The Coming Collapse of China, published by Random House in August 2001. Well-known contributor to Forbes.com, and you can find his blog over at worldaffairsjournal.org. Gordon, welcome back to An Economy of One. Well, thank you so much, and Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas to you and your family. I appreciate that. You know, we talked last July. It seems like it wasn't that long ago, but uh, we talked last July and uh, talked a lot about the Chinese yuan and and uh, what the IMF might do and <clears throat> and that kind of stuff. And just a few weeks later in August, we had uh, 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 a fairly decent-sized correction uh, in the Chinese yuan in a very, very short period of time. And uh, uh, tell us a, a little bit of your thoughts on that, and then I want to move over to the IMF and, and what they've been doing. Well, on August 11th, China devalued the RMB, and uh, it was only a small devaluation um, in the scheme of things, but nonetheless, it triggered a loss of confidence, and so Beijing had to spend um, something like $20 billion a day defending their currency. Right now, after the inclusion of the currency in the IMF's special drawing rights, which you just referred to, mm -hmm. um, the currency has been falling. And this is essentially a reflection of the weakness of the Chinese economy and essentially people not having confidence in the ability of Beijing to manage their economy. Now, it isn't part of, I mean, uh, the, the um, central government there, the People's Bank of China or, or whoever's in control of that, haven't they really <clears throat> had a kind of a tight grip on their currency and, and how it moves and how it's traded and, and that kind of stuff for a long time? Uh, can one look at this and say, hey, they're starting to loosen up their grip so that they could be more widely accepted uh, in the Forex and in the SDRs? Yeah, well, they have exercised very tight control of their currency. They've manipulated it, uh, and most of the time they've manipulated to a value below what the market dictated, and they did that to help exporters. Mm -hmm. Now, before the IMS decision uh, to include the renminbi in the special drawing rights, they were manipulating the currency above market value in order to convince the IMF that it was a stable currency. Now that they're in, they don't care. And <laughs> so essentially they are letting the currency drift lower, and uh, they're trying to do so in a controlled fashion. They're still manipulating their currency, right. but they are controlling the descent downwards. The, I mean, is it their intention to uh, eventually get to what we would call a clear float on that currency? Well, they said they have wanted to do that, but they really have never gotten anywhere close to that. And even today, um, one can argue that the intervention is even worse than it was before, because in the past, Beijing only intervened in the domestic currency market. Since August, they've been intervening in foreign renminbi markets as well. And so now you have the specter of Beijing spending a lot more money defending its currency, both home and abroad. That's not a real indication of a government that wants to liberalize. Now, just a couple weeks ago, and tell me how this fits in, but just a couple weeks ago, um, the People's Bank of China kind of caught everybody off guard saying that they were going to no longer use uh, the dollar as the sole currency for their exchange rate. Instead, they were going to go to a basket of currencies. What's this mean to the yuan and what's it mean to, to the dollar? Well, because the dollar right now is so strong, essentially what that means is that the RMB is going to drift lower with regard to the dollar. Now, they have said things like this before in the past, so this, in a sense, is not new. Okay. Um, and what they're trying to do is convince everyone that they really want a more market-determined exchange rate. But that's really, I think, a little bit of, um, you know, this, this, they have intervened so much that it's really hard to take them at their word. Only when they actually stop intervening will we know that they're serious about this goal. And basically up to now, they can't do that because if they did it, the currency would plunge through the floor and there would be panic. You know, it, it's funny you, you mentioned trusting their numbers because <clears throat> in anticipation of coming on, I just reviewed everything we've been reading about. And it seems like there's 20 different things to read every day on, 
on China all over the place. But uh, one article caught my mind, actually two caught my mind, where they came out in the last, gosh, the last week or so and said for the next, I think they said five years or something, they expect their GDP to grow at 6.5 uh, per year. And I had to kind of laugh at that because I, I thought, you know, uh, God protect the uh, the regional guy that turns in 5.3 or something. I mean, he's he's going to disappear with his family. But then I read another article that one of the northern provinces that has a, a major major contribution to the GDP just kind of admitted they've been been cooking the books every year for the last several years. Yeah, well, they were caught cooking the books. I don't oh, think okay. they admitted cooking the books. <laughs> but um, the official Xinhua News Agency, to its credit, did talk about this. Uh, the 6.5% what you're talking about is mm -hmm. um, Chinese President Xi Jinping has said that China needs at least 6.5% growth in order to double the size of the economy by 2020 over right. the 2010 number. And so um, basically people are keying in on that 6.5 number. Now, China says that it grew 6.9 in the third calendar quarter of this year. Right. It's probably more like 1% or 2% when you start looking at some of the other official numbers plus other private surveys. It shows an economy that is just barely growing, if it's growing at all. Now, the, you know, China's uh, uh, economy is, is highly dependent on exports and, and highly dependent on exports of, of different commodities. Um, I just read an article about um, uh, America or the United States kind of shooting the first, first uh, arrow out there on some serious um, taxes or tariffs uh, on steel. Uh, I've read several things where China's being accused of kind of exporting okay. deflation. Uh, is, is all of this adding to or illustrative of their, their economic problems? Yes, there's an overcapacity problem in the manufacturing sector, which is very serious. And steel, as you point out, is really ground one of this problem. Mm -hmm. And so China has been selling steel around the world. Many people or many countries say that they've been dumping. In mm -hmm. other words, selling in uh, foreign markets <laughs> at costs below uh, manufacture in China. And the European Union in particular is going to raise these issues, as well as the United States, the um, problem right now is that China has just too many steel mills, too many coal mines, too much of everything, which was essentially the result of unproductive investment that was directed from the center in Beijing. And now they're going to have to reconcile this. They're called zombie companies um, by the Chinese state media and by Chinese leaders themselves, and they know that they've got to close them, but it's very hard for them to do so. Wow. I, we're discussing China's real economic numbers with Gordon Chang, a contributor at Forbes and blogger at worldaffairsjournal.org is, you know, I find it interesting. I just read uh, something about, uh, I forget who it was, that rated the world's countries as far as economic freedom, and Hong Kong is, is number one. Unfortunately, we're number 16, but Hong Kong's number one. Why is it that, that Beijing doesn't look at Hong Kong and say, hey, let's do that? Well, they can't do that, because if they were to have a Hong Kong-style economy, money would be gushing out of the country at even a faster pace than it is now. In the third calendar quarter, just to show you how bad things are, uh, there was $460.6 billion of net capital outflow, according to Bloomberg. And that's basically almost a $2 trillion a year pace. Mm -hmm. Now, if China were to have an open capital account like Hong Kong does, well, there wouldn't be any money left in the country, and so they know they can't do this. They've got a system which is heavily dependent on state direction, and in order to reform it, they'd have to be willing to accept years of sub-zero growth, and they're just not willing to do that. Is their economy, I mean, are they going through some growing pains? Is their economy changing more from a, a manufacturing to more of a, a consumer economy? Are they trying to to build their GDP from, from their citizens, from their, their, their people consuming more? Well, that's what they want. Um, they say that. But they've been saying that now for more than a decade. In fact, the Chinese economy is moving from manufacturing to consumption, not because consumption is growing fast. It's not. It's actually growing at probably a, 
a 3 or 4% pace at most. But the reason why the economy is transforming itself from manufacturing to consumption is because manufacturing is contracting. And so just by arithmetic, um, consumption is becoming much more important. So when you look at the three elements of an economy, investment, consumption, and net exports, consumption is becoming a bigger proportion, not because it's really growing fast, but because investment and net exports are falling. Okay. Now, the, you mentioned a lot of the capital was outflowing uh, out of the country. Uh, where's it going? I mean, is it coming to the United States? Is it, you know, are they, we, we hear stories and uh, I've been in the business a long time. And I remember back in the eighties, Japan was buying all of our real estate. And I said, don't worry about it in 30 years, we will not be speaking Japanese. And, and now we see a lot of uh, Chinese money coming in, buying real estate. Where, where is all that money outflowing to? Well, a lot of it is coming to the United States. Um, a lot of it's going to Canada, Australia, Hong Kong, which is technically part of the People's Republic of China, but mm-hmm. is effectively a separate economy. It's just going to Europe. Um, New York is, is one of the favorite destinations. There are those two tall condominium buildings, one on 57th Street and the other um, just a little bit a block or two away on Park. Well, the joke is that half of those condominiums are owned by Russians and the other half by Chinese. <laughs> now, that's an exaggeration, but it's not too much of an exaggeration. Right. And the Chinese are also buying up most of Detroit um, because they think it's a bargain. Yeah. Um, and they very well may be right about Detroit. Yeah. Um, but clearly the money is coming into the United States at a very fast pace. Well, didn't, uh, didn't President Obama in this latest uh, budget bill, wasn't there something in there um, getting rid of some excess taxes on, on foreign money coming into buying real estate and stuff here? Did you read that? I didn't see that. Um, but, you know, uh, I, I think that the money will come here regardless of, of whether there's any change in the taxation of foreign investors, um, largely because it's coming here because of two reasons. First of all, the United States has a very strong currency at the moment, so mm-hmm. just even sitting in dollars is a good deal for a lot of people, especially the Chinese, where they have a currency which is not quite collapsing, but it could very well do that in the future. And the second reason, of course, is the U.S. has a strong political system. It's resilient. Um, this is the safe haven for the world. And so, you know, we have seen um, money come into the U.S., even when the dollar is weak. Uh, so you put those two reasons together right now, and the U.S. has a too strong currency. Um, too good for It's too strong for our good. But the foreigners just want to buy up parts of the U.S., yeah, and, and raising interest rates certainly certainly helps that uh, Absolutely. Uh, a little bit also makes the dollar a, a little bit stronger. Uh, we got about uh, 45 seconds or so left, Gordon. Uh, real quick, uh, one, I'm assuming that the Chinese currency will uh, be part of the SDRs next October. It's, it's not etched in stone. There are things that can derail that, I understand. One, do you think that's going to happen? And two, real quickly... What, what do you think that'll mean from a global economic standpoint? Well, yeah, the, the renminbi will be in the SDR. That's a political decision that IMF uh, Managing Director Christine Lagarde made, so okay. it's probably going to happen. But, you know, the other side is that China has promised reforms to open up um, their currency, and if they do that, they're dead. So I actually don't think that they will honor their promises. Oh, that's some insight. I should have asked that first before we ran out of time. So, uh, well, we've been speaking with Gordon Chang, a lawyer and author, been in China and Hong Kong for a couple of decades, uh, wrote the book, A Coming Collapse of China, Forbes contributor and blogs at worldaffairsjournal.org. Gordon, once again, uh, time went by too quick. I really appreciate you taking the time from your family uh, to spend with us and answering our questions and uh, hope we can tap you on the shoulder again soon. Well, thank you so much. I really enjoyed it. And Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas to you and your family. Thank you very much. Be safe. I'm Gary Rathman with Doug Miller.